Today's show is brought to you by Imperial Yeast. You hear us gushing over Imperial Yeast all the time, and that's because their yeast performs for us in every batch that we brew. Imperial Yeast is adored by commercial breweries and home brewers alike. Their pitch right pouches are jam packed with over 200 billion fresh yeast cells, guaranteed to deliver flawless, fast fermentations every time. Imperial yeast strains are grown by a team of pro brewers and home brewers who live to help other brewers learn more and ferment better. Join any recipe receiving tier of our super duper homebrew club and get a free upgrade to premium Imperial yeast with every recipe kit that ships out to you. Learn more at homebrewhappyhour.com forward slash club and come brew with us. Entertaining shows with content that spreads information and sparks discourse throughout the community. This is the Pearl Media Network. When to add puree, how long to cool wort, barrel aging beer in a keg, and we welcome Olin and Chris for more beer on the show. This is Homebrew Happy Hour, episode 252. Hello and welcome to the Homebrew Happy Hour. This is the show where we supply the answers to your homebrewing questions and discuss all things related to craft beer. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. I am your host, Joshua Steuben. Today, I'm joined by the director of... I know you're the president, owner, chief keg washer of Keg Connection. I'm so used to introducing James, and he's not here today. Uh, Mr. Todd Burns. Thank you. And, and then we have two special guests on the show. Let me make sure I get this right. I have my handy-dandy notes. And, and y'all are right. I do write it in very small font. Um, I'm excited to have on Olin and Chris from morebeer.com. Olin is the CEO and co-founder of More Beer, More Flavor. And Chris is the president of More Beer, More Flavor. Both have been brewing for 20 plus years and are still extremely passionate about the brewing process and community gentlemen welcome to the show thank you for coming on thanks Thanks for having us we really i I like the in unison so for the longest time i'd ask todd and james you know how they're doing and todd started getting annoyed so i i'm not going to ask y'all how you're doing i'll just assume you're doing good you're in california the weather's i'm I'm assuming is pretty decent it seems like it always is in y'all's area i imagine it's pouring rain today josh oh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thanks for asking. Anyways, we got to go. Uh, no. we'll, put, we'll put life in relativity for you. I filled up with gas this morning and it's uh, four dollars and fifty seven cents a gallon. Four fifty seven. I was mad that it was three oh four and here in Comanche. I had to fill up my I, I drove past and I was like, I got to fill up on my drive home and it's three oh four. This is terrible. Well, I didn't realize you were visiting. Uh, you were in Europe at the moment. That's uh, <laughs> that's about what it was when I was last time I was there. Wow! That, that's those taxes for all of our beautiful roads that have no potholes, right, Chris? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whoa, your roads are like ours. <laughs> well, 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 we have refineries less than ten miles away. Do you really? Where you're at? Yep. Oh, well, that then totally yeah. made sense. You know, we no, they, do. They live in a different area. Yeah. Oh, well, we have the bureaucracy complaint podcast as well, but that's a different show. Uh, I'd love to have y'all on there too. But, um, <laughs> um, I did. I did. I guess Todd at the top. You know, we we've ne- well. First off, I really do appreciate y'all coming on. We see y'all uh, before COVID. We see y'all at least once a year at Homebrew Con. Uh, one of y'all's booth. It was in Minneapolis, I believe. Y'all had my favorite booth because you did the the instant photos and, and with all the props. And I have a photo yep. of me and Todd and James on my wall. I think James is in a Viking hat or a cowboy hat. And Todd, you had, I don't know, we were drunk. But that was my favorite. When, when things go back to normal, are y'all going to bring something like that back to your booth? Because I really hope you do. For sure. I, okay, I'm holding you, I'm holding you to it because like I guess that was my favorite. But, we'll see you there. Yeah, we'll see you there. Yeah, in Pittsburgh and and beautiful no potholes on the road Pittsburgh I've heard. But anyway, Todd, uh, I'll I'll let you start it off uh, hand sure. the reins over to you and and why did we bring Olin and Chris on besides their so awesome company? We have a we have a pretty big announcement. We we are actually have decided to exit the ingredients and homebrewing equipment side of the business. And as you know, we, our, our main website is kegconnection.com, 
that we've had for many, many years. But we also have homebrewsupply.com, which is uh, where, where we sort of got into the ingredients part of it. We were in it a little bit, but we got into it uh, with, with both feet, as they say. And we have decided to exit that space. And more beer has graciously decided to take over that URL. So all of our traffic will be redirected to more beer now. And we've, we've worked with, with these guys for a long time. Uh, great people, great company. It's been around for, I think, over 25 years or uh, now officially over 25 years, right? That's correct. So it's, it's a very good site, great recipes, uh, just, just really good people to deal with. So I, I think that our customers that were buying ingredients from us before will be very well taken care of. And we, we appreciate you doing that as well. We appreciate it and look forward to it. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely serve all the hungry supply customers the best that we can. I, I yeah. like it. You, oh, go ahead, Todd. No, go ahead. I was, no, do, do you, if you don't mind, can you, can you tell us a little bit about the history of more beer and, and how you got into the space, just to kind of give a, an overview of the company. For sure. So we we started, or I started in 1995 with my brother, Darren, who's still a partner. And Chris on what, is the... On what day? April 1st. <laughs> Chris likes that part. So then Chris came on as a partner at two years later. And so it's the three of us still uh, operating, still working in the company today. We originally started in in a shed behind the house that was probably about 10 by 15. I think there's a picture up on our website of that. And uh, just shipping orders uh, as well as we can. We had police pulling up uh, into our driveway who actually needed supplies. We weren't supposed to have people coming over, but everybody wanted to come over, didn't want me to deliver it. I used to do all the deliveries in the local area. And uh, we had police pulling up in the driveway. I was getting a little bit concerned because all my neighbors are asking me why, you know, the cops are, are pulling up. And then that's the same, the story with Chris. He called me. I wanted to deliver to his house. He said, no, he wanted to come see the, the shop. So he demanded to come over. And, and pretty soon we had to move into a warehouse because we had too many people uh, going through Darren's backyard where his wife was laying out sunning and uh, didn't like a million random customers coming into her backyard, which is a little understandable. <laughs> so we moved into a warehouse and just have uh, slowly grown from there. Wow. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't know if you know this, but we started in a shed as well. I was I was going to say luxury when you said the size of your shed, because I can still remember that ours was 16 by 8 foot. And uh, we we had all everything set up mm-hmm. to build. You know, we only did draft beer equipment, but we had everything set up to build these kits. In fact, Josh, I think you filled kits uh, within the first year or two, right? I, I within the well, I I I started fulfilling kits in the second month because I was the only I was the second employee. The first one, uh, Ben, was going to school, and one time he's like, "Man, I can't be there most of the time this week. Let me show you how to do them." And I didn't pay attention and. Um, <laughs> We may have had to do a lot of order corrections, and then they didn't let me do kit fulfillment again for like another three months. I was back on keg washing. But yeah, the the shed life, I, I respect that because that was the whole first year of employment for Todd in his backyard before he also realized like vendors, customers were wanting to come see the place. And he's like, this is where I live. This, you know, you have to walk to my, my home and my kitchen to get to this. Uh, let's do the warehouse spot. And well, Todd, Todd, did you have an old van? Because that seems to be a unifying like start out too. Is like the old uh, scary looking van. I uh, never, I never had the old van. I missed that part of it. Wow. <laughs> well, and I would go over to see Olin, and, and sometimes be like, "Hey, can you help me out? We're gonna lift this drum, fifty-five gallon drum of malt extract, up three stairs into this little shed." And I'm not that tall. I'm six two. But I would crack my head on that entryway to the shed every single time we went through that door. Um, There's only way six hundred fifty pounds, Chris. So you know, it's not like they're that heavy. <laughs> I, I used to do, would be doing customer service and fulfilling the orders and doing everything as you know, Todd, in the beginning. So I would be pouring mold extract out of the drum for these orders into these jugs that we would ship out, and then I'd simultaneously get a call for an order. Right, <laughs> so invariably every week I, i'd be talking on the phone be pouring mold extract go to start taking an order forget i was pouring mold extract 
come back and, and I would have 30 or 40 pounds all over oh, the floor. No. So I, I got to be a super expert at uh, scraping malt extract off the, off oh, the floor. Boy. So when we moved into an actual warehouse and we actually had some employees, I would usually pull the youngest ones to the side and be like, all right, you're going to see Olin fulfilling orders and doing this. If you see him open that drum of malt extract and walk away, <laughs> it's your job to get over there and turn that drum off. That's fantastic. Oh, that's I love it. Multitasking. That. Yeah. See, y'all had a good sense of humor. Todd just yelled at me till I cried. But um, <laughs> yeah, you know, they, different strokes, well, different folks. You know, uh, I've actually I've been to your California warehouse. I haven't been to your. The other one is, I believe, in Pennsylvania. Is that right? Yes. You just outside right. of Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh. Okay. So yeah. yeah, I've been to the California warehouse and it is, it is quite a facility. It's a beautiful facility, really well set up and organized. And, uh, I, I was, I've been a little, uh, envious of your warehouse when I saw it. It's, it's really, really a nice facility. So when did the growth oh. happen? Uh, cause y'all, I mean, you started, like you said, in California shed and y'all were beer, beer, and more beer. And uh, which I wish you'd go back to, because I, I like the idea of calling in and beer, beer and more beer or something like that. Like, I, I like the idea of that. But either way, more beer now. When was the need for y'all to expand uh, and, and then go East Coast? Do y'all have roots over there or was it just a, hey, what is the most um, not like convenient location where we can serve customers better from the, on that side of the country? Because shipping out of California to Maine or something is probably not an enjoyable experience for anyone involved. Can I tell them the story, all? I don't know what story you're going to tell, so. <laughs> oh, perfect. Uh, so uh, what was that? Uh, 2011, I think. We're, we had a big meeting, just uh, the owners and a couple of our key guys. And we're doing well financially. And what's the, what's the next best thing we can do for our customers? Like, what can we do to make the company better? And we always think of our customers first. I'm sure you do the same thing. It's always Absolutely. like, you know, what, what new service, what new this? And we all agreed we, we've got to expand out east. Um, we're shipping, like you said, from California um, and trying to do that. So we, we meet with FedEx and we were shipping UPS at the time, but FedEx was trying to woo us. So they did like a huge analysis of everywhere we ship to. And they came back to us and said, like, okay, you have this, um, you know, the, the optimal place is Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we're like, oh, okay. So we have a meeting that day and my wife is pregnant and we have a sonogram that afternoon. So we sit through this meeting all day long, hammering out the details. We're going to do this East Coast move. It's going to require this. The website's going to have to be able to handle inventory in both coasts and checkouts and, and what happens when we don't have inventory here and this and that and try to get like the best experience for the customer. So we go through all that. My brain's fried. Get to the sonogram place and, the, you know, they're doing a the little thing and they're like, oh, there's heartbeat. Oh, there's another heartbeat. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait, you got to be kidding me. In this time frame, <laughs> oh, wow. we're going to be open in this East Coast location and my wife's <laughs> going to be having twins. And I'm probably going to need to be going to this East Coast location a lot. <laughs> Hey, that's good timing, uh, right? <laughs> it all worked out. I was going to ask, did, did, yeah, did it all work out? Like, obviously it did. You're still married and uh, the East Coast operation has been going. What year was that, did you say, that y'all expanded? I think we talked about it in 2011 and did it in 2012. Do okay. I have that right, Olin? I think 2000, yeah, 2012, 2013. Right, End of 2012. Yeah. And then maybe we maybe we took it live to the public. In twenty in like January of twenty thirteen, so I remember when it happened because it was a big deal. It was like, oh wow, like uh, because like you know, like we've already said before, being able like um, in the day in the age of Amazon, people expect quick, quick. They want it now. Like they order it today and it better be on my door tomorrow or I'm going over to Jeff Bezos and, you know, paying what and and so it's hard to, you know, because being a shop online, they may have a perception of, oh, well, every, you know, Amazon, Walmart, more beer, Keck Connection. It's all the same, right? It's like, but it's not. <laughs> Walmart and Amazon. I mean, I drive around Texas towns all the time and Walmart has a distribution center and, you know, every fifth town that I drive through, and it's like, I would love to have a Cat Connection distribution center, but <laughs> in every town. Uh, maybe I wouldn't, actually. I'm lying. No, but. we don't want one in every town. No, <laughs> no I'm lying. I wouldn't uh, either. So I, I'm dying to hear this story. I, uh, I understand that you've brewed recently, 
And, and we'd like to hear about your most recent brew experience, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, we recently brewed on the top of Mount Whitney. Chris and I went on a backpacking trip and brewed a pale ale on top because 25 years ago, we started just after that. Chris, when was it? 97, I guess. 98. 98. Uh, Regan and I, who was our, our fourth owner that retired, he and I brewed on the top of Mount Whitney. There had been on the Homebrew Digest, if you remember that. I don't know, you know, tell if you remember the Homebrew Digest that would come in our email box every day. Uh, there was some guys and gals that had brewed in Colorado at you know, 14, four, whatever that peak is. And we said, well, we can beat that North American high, high elevation brew record. So we brewed at 14, five. And that was actually the day that Chris came in to start with the company was when Regan and I left. So we kind of gave him a high five and like, he didn't know anything about the shop and we're like, run the shop <laughs> run for the four shop. days while we're gone. Right. <laughs> So for our 25th anniversary, we were talking about what we could do. We decided we were going to go back together and brew on the top of Mount Whitney. That's but instead of, instead of doing it the easy way, like, which is, I, I say easy, it's not easy. It's, it's a, what, 22 mile hike, I think, from the base to the top and back. Correct. We decided to go the backpacking route. Um, so we did the 40 something mile. Um, and we, there's a fish that is the California um state fish and it only lives above eleven thousand feet and so we packed in our fly rods and um way too heavy of backpacks uh, because we had all our brewing stuff fly fishing stuff and stuff to eat and live off of and and uh did a four-day hike holy moly now tell me it was it was at stretch right there's no way you did you carry grains out there and did all ton? did you i'm not gonna go to the yeah. top of that and do extract <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> i'm sorry it's just my lazy brain i, I thought like, how how okay who y'all obviously on the way there could divvy up oh you carry this or now carry that but who carried the fermenter back <laughs> like yeah or did y'all so, so we we did a nice video on it and uh we'll send you over the link um okay. but it's, we'll uh, put it in the show notes so people can see it cool cool but uh, you know uh Olin was off somewhere i think uh with his family in tahoe so i decided well maybe we should do a test batch first so we have a brew room um so i decided okay i'm gonna do this. I, I go to REI. I get a backpacking stove. I have one somewhere at home, but I doubt it works from 20 something years ago. And, and a couple of these new tanks that I'm not used to. And, and so I start setting out to do like time, but I got sheets. And I'm writing down the time of starting and this and what my temperature drop is. Well, I'm in California. My temperature drop is nothing, this, that, and the other. So I've got it like, oh, and I've got it. We're just, we're going to take some shorter mash, shorter boil, um, but, uh, you know, so we're going to overhop a little bit so we can do a shorter boil, blah, blah, blah. Got it all down to just under two hours, you know, cause you don't want to be on the top of that mountain peak for a long time. Lightning comes and things like that. Yep. So, well, we get up there and at what temp was it all in 30? High thirties. High thirties at best. Um, and so everything's out the door. We go in at the right temperature, but we miss the mass temp. So impromptu. We do a pseudo decoction uh, to keep the mash temp in the right range because uh, we have a little two gallon kettle and it's getting bombarded by all this cold air. And uh, but it was a ton of fun. But I bet getting oh, down to pitching like temps was pretty quick. Right. I mean, well, what, what I did was so one of our vendors makes a uh, hot pack bags. So the food grade material out of boil. So instead of cooling it down and transferring it over, we just had a funnel set up and poured it right from the boil kettle out of boil, which is by the way, only 183 um, into the bag. And then, like I said, we were trying to hightail it out of there. So we just put it right in our backpack and started h- hiking. That's fantastic. I love that. It's just later that night. Yeah. Yeah. Is there uh, in the continental U S at least, is there a higher peak you could brew it at because uh, I'm, I'm not gonna try it I'm, I'm not i'm not not, gonna... not in the lower 48 and definitely not in texas <laughs> yeah no oh yeah no we now, pu- josh josh is gonna do that but he's gonna stand on a 10-foot ladder when he does that's it, right so, uh, that's right <laughs> gonna beat us by 10 feet that's yeah. right no so, I... it's 30 it's 34 10 feet up it's, it's 38 down the... <laughs> so the obvious question is how was the beer well, we're actually gonna try it later today Later today. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's exciting. Yeah. That's good. How was the first batch that you, you did with 25 years ago? Did that one turn out? 
good or did you like 25 years ago did you have the blinders of like what you know oh my home brews went real good and now 25 years later you're like yeah 25 years ago wasn't that great now i've kind of gotten it better. i think it was amazing it was actually they did all during 25 years ago too and that's you know oh wow uh, yeah, yeah. I, i'll say this as someone who came i worked at other homebrew shops in college i went to university of oregon where we we're lucky to have homebrew shops around us and and i met olin and and he's always had a mindset so different from most homebrew shop owners and like there was there's zero cans of malt extract in his in his world always about fresh um trying to get people into all grain and and successfully doing so and we were kind of always an all grain first quality of beer first so it was it, it, it's kind of awesome in that that beer you guys brewed i thought was super tasty um, cause I did get to have that side of it. And, you know, I think most of us made our beginning homebrew mistakes in the first few years before the business was around. That's awesome. So, For sure. And you have, uh, so that you brewed in the, at the highest altitude, but you've also brewed at the lowest altitude, I believe. Is it? That was a lot easier, Todd. We, we pulled up to death Valley with our van and loaded our stuff out into the salt flats and, uh, all brewed Darren. Chris, JP, and myself all brewed a beer um, at low elevation, which is like we had a cooler of ice cold beer we could drink whenever we want, or water, or whatever you wanted. You know, hiking up to Whitney, it's like I was debating like how much extra water because we got to carry all the brewing water. How much extra to drink are we going to bring? Because this this stuff's heavy. (laughs) Oh yeah, and you, I guess there's places you could. Are there there's places on the trail, obviously, where you can get water. It is, but it, it's it's about six miles shy of the summit is the last bit of water you can get. Okay, and uh, so and and that's like a lot of your like switchback, straight up, high altitude, and I'm barely able to breathe. Yeah, well, that, so yeah. so we used to uh, we backpacked a lot, both of us, in Big Bend National Park, and there's no water there. I mean, you have, if you're backpacking, you got to take all the water with you for as long as you're going to go. And I, I'll never forget. We had my dad on the show a couple, a couple of episodes ago for our 250th anniversary. And he's the per- first person I ever brewed with. And I, I don't even know how long I, I always tell people I brewed since I was like six, we brewed beer when I was like 16 or 17 years old, you know, back then it wasn't really looked down upon as like it is now just probably So of course, but, uh, <laughs> for kids anyway, to brew is what he means. For kids. So I, I've actually, uh, <laughs> I guess I started brewing before that because I brewed with my dad, but anytime we would go backpacking, the weight was so hard to, to get down because of all the water we had to carry. And for years and years, we'd get to the very top of the summit. And my dad would say, son, hand me a beer out of your backpack. And I'd go, no, no, you didn't get me this year. I double checked it before we left. And Every year he would have, he, he put a couple of beers in my backpack and maybe carry all the way up. So, <laughs> that's that's awesome. what you do with a 16 year old son. I mean, come yeah. on. No, this was like when I was 11 or 12. Yeah. yeah. He was, he was mean, very mean. Yeah. So. Anyway, you slice it. That sounds great. <laughs> yeah. 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 I need a son who would carry a beer. Yeah, right. No kidding. I, Todd usually sneaks stuff into my luggage, and I find it when we land wherever we're going. Like, what the crap? He goes, oh, yeah, I put that in there. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's fresh. Weapons and such. Weapons yeah. and such. One time we were coming back from Portland, and I you know, I could have gotten arrested. I won't go into details, but the thing that accidentally ended up in my bag. But anyway. Uh, Todd. <laughs> Todd. That was not me. That was absolutely innocent. Um, you know, you go, you went over the, the history and whatnot. I do want to ask real quick. We get a lot of, of questions from people on the industry side and we're not going too deep, but 25 years is a long time to be a home brewer. How do you see the, like, what are the trends you've seen in the industry that have been most interesting to you in regards to maybe brewing styles or uh, methods of brewing? Cause like, I don't know if y'all are on the internet a lot. I go on Reddit, even though Reddit doesn't like me, but I'm on there all the time. And there's some wild stuff people are doing. And sometimes I wonder like, is that a trend or is that just someone trolling? Because like, why would you do that to, as a home brewer? And I think there's a subreddit now called why are home brewers like this? Because there's some just goofy stuff, but what are, what are some of the trends y'all have seen over the years that have either like intrigued you or some that have stuck around for the long haul or just the wild and bizarre? 
I think originally in the nineties, it was, I spent so much time convincing people that they, there was other beer styles other than Coors and Budweiser because the craft beer just wasn't, that wasn't a given like it is today. So we spent a lot of time convincing people that there was other styles of beer and then yeast, liquid yeast really came in such small quantities that you had to build it up that uh, I think that that it had a lot of chance for contamination during those buildups. And so the kind of the first shift was, okay, now we've got yeast that's in quantity that's really easy to pitch. And then uh, the second major wave, you know, and I'm talking about just like the major macro kind of trends over 25 years was, was the shift from cans to using mold extract and steeping grains. And then uh, the second shift to really in the last probably five years of the all-in-one brewing systems. And then the latest kind of big shift that, that we see is just the, the coming of dry yeast, where dry yeast quality is equal to liquid yeast, mm-hmm. but it's so much easier for brewers to use that, you know, we, we, we have a saying here that there's, there's a dry yeast revolution coming in, in home brewing if it, if it hasn't already. And it's just really uh, the, the only thing that holds it back is selection. And now we're seeing just, you know, a, a large amount of selection of dry yeast coming. How is so those are some of the major trends. Chris, I don't know what uh, you'd add. To that. I'll say it from a different standpoint, because I'm a gearhead. And, yeah. you know, we've had a guy with us for years. His name's Colin. And uh, we would, I mean, from 20 something years ago, we'd sit around and talk about, well, what if we made a conical, but you could do your boil in it and then you know, take your mash basket out and then boil in it and do your ferment in it. And that, now these are products, you know, and, but, but the, at the time to build it 20 something years ago, access to the right things just wasn't there yet. Um, whether there wasn't enough people buying it to where we could make it in size, but nowadays we come up with a great idea, anyone. And it's like, that could actually be a product and we're bringing products and we have a, uh, R and D department. And, and I look at the list of stuff we're bringing in the last four to five years. And it's so cool to see that acceleration, you know, where we can uh, bring things to market that 20 years ago seemed impossible. Um, sometimes with electronics, sometimes just stainless fabrication. Um, but just, you know, the access to professional Things. Olin talks about, you know, we, we, I always have the evolution of people brewing and what they should do next. And for me, it's typically, you know, getting the right pitch of yeast, if, if, you know, whatever that is, and dry yeast, you know, how it makes that so much easier. Getting the right fermentation temperature, which Quebec makes that easier. Um, and then, uh, you know, getting them into kegging. And it's like, you, you do those three things and you got someone who's going to want to do this. Um, and the, the, the rest becomes an obsession, just like anything else. But those things, I mean, you know, these little Inkbird temp controllers are just, they work great and they're so cheap um, that it used to be, oh, you want to do that? Here's your hundred and whatever dollar temp controller for your fridge. And now here's your 20 something dollar thing. And, and so it's much more adaptable, much quicker for people. So people, I think, are making better beer right off the get go, as opposed to, you know, I know for myself. My first batch sucked. It should have been poured out. And if I didn't have 18 year old friends who were jonesing for it, it, it wouldn't have been drank. Uh, but, you know, some of us do that and love the process so much we keep going. But how many people have you guys met over the years who are like, I made beer once, it sucked, I'm out? Yeah. Absolutely. No, that is a, a trend. And, a I, people, I, and I agree with what y'all said with the technology part is specifically like the all in ones or electric brewing in general. It's blown my mind in the last yeah five years where it's gone from kind of novelty like yeah that's cool if you live in an apartment or whatever to now like people who send us their setups it's like a little pro brewery whether it's the all-in-one or herms brewing you know we're we're big fans we do we do it on a three vessel herms setup and um it's just so incredible how the affordable technology is there for a home brewer to make consistently good beer which I think yeah. is great for our craft, our hobby, because when you're consistently making good beer, you want to keep doing that. Right? And, well, and you think of like the explosion of craft beer in the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it was growing before 10 years ago, but it's been an explosion. Oh, yeah. And and we got to assume 90 something percent of them came out of home brewing. And I think that happened because all of a sudden, 
the ability to brew good beer was there um, where it wasn't, you know, my first batch was two cans of malt extract with the yeast underneath the lid and a plastic bucket that shockingly looked just like the trash cans they sell at Target. And like, you know, it, well, and Chris, you brought up equipment. And if you remember, like we, we made the first uh, brewing system, there wasn't really these brewing systems being sold and welded up. And it's like, well, people are going to be interested in this to, to buy it. Right. And we got our first customer in Washington and we drove it to him. And then the, the stainless conicals, because we, we came out with the first stainless steel conical for home brewing. And at the time, it's like, well, that's a lot of money. You know, is anybody going to buy that? And uh, you, you're making a few. And now you see like that's just a given, you know, almost that at some point you're, you're going to graduate to a stainless conical. Yeah. Well, and we started going to the home uh, National Homebrewers Conference pretty early on um, and, and sponsoring it and being part of like the club night and whatnot. And I remember one club night. Baltimore, I think, 04, 05, something like that. And I remember I was behind this group of people and they were looking at our booth at club night. And that guy's like, oh, those are those crazy guys who think I'm going to spend $900 on a stainless conical. Who needs that? And I just heard, I, you know, I didn't say a word, but you, you, you hear it like, okay, that's a different opinion, you know, because um, I was like selling that kind of stuff and the people who are excited for it. But nowadays, stainless conicals are like, Oh, you have a plastic carboy, uh, uh, this, oh, a stainless conical, whatever. Throw that in there too. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. It is. I, we, we're huge believers in it. We, yeah. we've, um, I talked to James last week. I was like, why do I only have one fermenter, a stainless steel conical, you know, uh, a coiled, uh, cooled, uh, fermenter at my house. I should have two. Cause I had to put stuff in buckets last week. Cause I ran out of space, you know, <laughs> that, that's terrible. Right. <laughs> So I say this a lot on every episode almost, but uh, y'all probably agree that it's the best time ever to be a home brewer. Like speaking of uh, accessibility to the hobby, um, availability of quality ingredients. Um, and I guess I, you know, I was ranting about Amazon earlier, but quit shipping is now everyone has to rise to the occasion. Yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. and it, so, I mean, it's, it's super convenient to be a home brewer now. And it, you know, when COVID hit, I know everyone in every industry was like, oh, my God, what is this going to do to us? And there was like an explosion for a lot of companies. And and when lockdown happened of that April 2020 through a good chunk of time where people were just like, oh, I'm going to try this hobby out. You know, it was it was wild to see. I mean, I, it was great from a perspective of introducing new people to the hobby. It's unfortunate what it, it took to get that to happen, but it was incredible to watch. Yeah, yeah we, and we've seen it, you know, during down cycles in economics, too, you know, um, in the past. And, and it, it makes sense, especially for the lockdown. It makes a ton of sense of can't go to the bar. can't go to your favorite craft brewery easily. Uh, and people still buy into that myth, I think. And I say myth. Y'all can correct me if you think I'm wrong. That home brewing saves you money. Like that was that was a big part of when this. Oh, economy. it totally <laughs> saves you money. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. So does golf. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> it can, Chris. It can save you money. If you oh, I wrote the brewing economics article that we have up, so I, I know it could, in theory. Yeah. Um, if you no don't... hobby I've ever had has saved me money. You know, you, way, shape, or form. You nailed your, your fly fishing hobby hasn't. Uh, oh, I'm going to tie my own flies. Fish kill, yeah, tying my own flies has saved me so much money. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, and when you take those fishing trips and you get all that free fish i mean that's really saving you a lot of money and i do a lot of catch and release so that's even better <laughs> if you kept it though it wouldn't cost you more than two or three hundred dollars a pound right <laughs> yeah and, and i'm not good at math so more power to y'all that sounds like you're saving well money. i mean i bought a i bought a four pack of beers the other day and it was like 29 dollars. so right. i think homebrewing can save you money <laughs> you know what your other yeah. perspective we live in I, yeah go ahead todd Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you. No, I, we were in the store yesterday and I looked at a keg of beer that my wife really likes. Dos Equis Amber. Uh, that's one of her favorite beers. So James actually brewed her a, a kind of a clone of that. Uh, and it's, it's getting ready, but they had kegs in there and, and they were $80 a piece for six barrels. And I kind of added that up for, cause we always do 15 gallon batches. And I was like, you know what? 
We actually are saving money, you know, if you don't count <laughs> too, pay yourself too much for your time. Uh, well, that that's cheap compared to some of the, the craft beer cases. Oh, sure, cases. sure. Yeah, and absolutely. let's not talk about capital investment or anything like that. Yeah. No, it's just no. the, the ingredients are the only things we count. I, I don't have much in my <laughs> system at all. So, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. And this this not more than about ten grand, right, Josh? This episode, yeah, yeah, right. I know, right. This episode is brought to you by sarcasm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so before well, we, I was just say before we get into questions, um, I did just want to see, like, you know, obviously y- y'all are uh, you have acquired URLs before. We're not homebrew supply is not the first and all that. Do you see it like the future for homebrewing? Not necessarily just for what more beers plans are. Do y'all see it being? Um, you know, j- continuing to grow uh, the hobby with new brewers. Do you see existing brewers upping their game? Like, what are what are some of those trends in our industry that y'all see that are kind of encouraging or or, or different? Because I, I we go to the state of the homebrew industry talk every year for homebrew con when it was in person. I don't know if they did it the last two years virtual because we only logged on to do our presentation. I didn't actually watch any other ones. I watched Lorena Evans, but she's watching this. I promise, Lorena, I did watch. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, every time we go to them, it almost be like you want to turn on the depressing funeral music because it was a, a long talk about the industry is dying. Another uh, five million uh, brick and mortar shops have closed down. This is the end. You know, I mean, not quite. I'm paraphrasing, but it could be depressing. Where I'm like, oh, what do you mean? What do you mean by that? Is it was down two percent that year? Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, I know. But but, but what do y'all see for? for we the- we were in that same room, and I agree with you because they did that that uh, those. They typically do first thing in the morning after something fun like club night or yes. or yes. pro brewers night or something where you're drinking heavily and then you got to go to this the first thing in the morning. But uh, no, I, like anything else, I think there's been a shift and that's what that industry is not always good at doing. You know, is shifting and and being someone who's more on the you know we have four retail stores and we've seen those struggling uh, recently having more of a resurgence again. Uh, relative to the um, mail order. But I, I think, you know, you, you look at your millennial and I don't even know what the thing is after millennials. Zoomer. Uh, what? Gen, Gen Z. They call them Zoomers. Zoomers. Yeah. <laughs> but but they, they're, they're not so interested necessarily in going to a retail store, but they are seeming to be more interested in the experience. And I think that's where things will shift is, the experience of doing things. I mean, look at sourdough and kombucha and that kind of stuff. And I think beer is always going to hold a near and dear place to people. And the the beauty of it is there's so many different varietals and whatnot that I think as people learn about beer, and I mean, how many of your friends went from Bud Light drinkers to, you know, double IPA drinkers over the last like three years Mm -hmm. or so. Oh yeah. Um, and or you know, hazy I think that, IPA, yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that'll eventually learn. Like, I gave one a sour the other day, and that was probably a mistake. I need to find middle ground uh, between a true sour and not a kettle sour. Um, but uh, I think those people who are enjoying that will be like the next fleet of people that are, you know, we welcome into this as new customers. So, I think there's always going to be new customers. There's always going to be people who are getting into drinking beer. I mean, it's been around since the Sumerians. Yeah, Absolutely. I don't think it's going anywhere, but I have been interested to see like the the Gen Zers, how interested in health they are. And so a lot of low ABV drinking options, like you mentioned, like some seltzers and kombucha. It is wild to see all that. Exploring. Well, it is a beautiful thing because then they get the control. Yes, Absolutely. I agree completely. Oh yeah. I mean, I've been an advocate. I love kombucha and I, you want to talk about actually saving money. I do think making kombucha is the one part of the hobby. I can confidently say I save a ton of money making, have you ever buy commercial kombucha? It's like $3 a bottle. (laughs) If if not more. Yeah. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But, and then hard seltzers too. Um, Very expensive for something you can make a five gallon keg of for relatively cheap. Um, but anyway, if, in, in you know, just, just to be clear, I, I want to say that beer is good for you. So <laughs> we didn't mean to say in any way that beer wasn't good for you. Uh, we, 
We all drink it every day, and it's very good for us. We all right? drink so, it every day. Absolutely. Yeah, hold on. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's morning their time. It's not morning here. I can crack one open right, right. without yeah. judgment. Um, guys, if you don't mind, I'm going to segue us into the part where we do have a few questions that I'd love y'all's help on, especially the first one, because we don't usually brew like this. And if y'all don't either, then it's going to be a very short question. So first <laughs> question came from our buddy Gilbert, who uses submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com. Gilbert wrote, when do most home brewers add their fruit puree into the batch? I am newish to brewing, but I want to make a mango milkshake IPA. I haven't used the secondary before. Will I need to for adding puree? What are some best practices for adding puree and avoiding adding oxygen? Thanks, Josh. Gilbert, new to brewing and going right for a mango melt shake. I like that. That's ballsy. <laughs> what do you do? Y'all have either one of you? Because I, I I talked to Todd and I don't believe you have uh, actual experience using puree. Uh, one of our employees. well, I've, I've helped people with it because that's what we do, but. Yeah, it was kind of funny when he put this question on because I go, oh, you know, you know, I've never made a beer with puree, but obviously if you put that question on there, you must know the answer to it. And he was like, I said, I hope Olin or Chris, I hope Olin or Chris do. <laughs> so <laughs> Chris is raising his hand. I'm going to jump the question. We could probably both talk to it and, and use purees. I've used purees more in meads than I have in beer, but uh, our friend, uh, you may know his name, Jamil Zanishev. He used to be called the Pope. Yep. But uh, he did this awesome exper experiment before he owned Heretic where he wanted to understand fruiting in general and beer. So he made a base beer, made 20 gallons of it, and then did, you know, four different things. And, and I talked to him about it, you know, fresh fruit, purees, uh, control beer, and extract just to get an idea. And I said, like, okay, when are you going to add any? To, and, and this is the part I will never forget. Well, you always add beer after primary fermentation or fruit after. I'm like, oh, okay. Like, I'll just take that as gospel right there. So I always have. Um, and, uh, and we're not huge believers in, quote, secondary fermentation. In fact, I hate it. The, the oxygen pickup usually is never worth, never worth it. But I think you can have a primary fermentation and a tertiary or whatever you want to call it in the same vessel. So to uh, Gilbert, um, I, I yes, think that was yes. his name, um, I would do the base fermentation in five gallon, five and a half, whatever it's going to be in a big six and a half gallon fermenter uh, and then add the puree after the initial fermentation subsides. Maybe not all the way to like, you know, I don't know if you're an airlock counter or whatnot, but uh, just, you know, the, the initial croissant dies down, the initial um, fermentation subsides uh, as a, a great time to add it. Now, you were talking about sours and stuff earlier. Are you are you big on fruit in beer? Not necessarily just what you're brewing, but are, are you know. I know in California, y'all are much like I, I'm very staunch about like I like German. I'm I'm just I'm just stubborn. Todd will drink anything and he loves everything. We went to <laughs> when we went to Portland and we sounded went, wrong at some level. I don't know. I was I was I was unintentional. We, we went drink to drink anything, Todd. He'll drink anything. <laughs> we we went to I'll try anything. Uh, How about what, that? what was it called in Portland? That great notion or um um Oh, I forget the name of the place, but Sours was their thing. And we went with our, our buddy Joe and he's hands. Uh, Cascade Brewing? No, no, in Portland. It, like the word like notion or nation or something was in it in the brewery. Maybe it was Cascade. Maybe that's what it was. I, I forget. We were we were guests of two people who listened to the show. They 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 drove us there to this place. And the, the first one they handed me was this blueberry sour. And he was like, oh, taste it. It tastes like a blueberry pancake. And I was like... It does. I can't drink that all night. It'll give me a headache. I'm 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 sensitive to to sugars like that. But I I don't typically go for fruited beers. But there's a few that are like awesome. And and you know, going the sour route, I, I'm usually you know, a Cantillon junkie. You know, yeah. those types of sours, not all the kettle fruited sours and and that kind of stuff. Uh, but more of the actual bread of myces type sours. And when you're adding the puree, and this is a total question out of ignorance for me, is there additional activity to be expected or? Are oh, you absolutely. That's sugar right there. So it should renew, you know, you have all that healthy yeast, um, that, that can, when it was done, I would sanitize the outside of the can before you open it, but that can was pasteurized and such when it was made. So there's no worry about treating the stuff inside of it. Um, but it, it has a very high concentration of sugar in there. 
do y'all have, you know, the, the Oregon the puree fruit products are great, great purees to be adding in that way right after primary is over. Uh, do y'all on your site, do you, are, are the fruited beers, like, do y'all have any that y'all even ship out with puree or those gaining popularity? Cause we did a lot of questions. Well, mainly we get questions of people who want us to drink sours on the show. Cause they know how I feel about the style, but uh, a, lo- a lot of people seem to be wanting to brew them and fruited, fruited beers. Yeah. Uh, adding so we puree. sell like our, our most popular one is uh, K-pop, um, which is after <laughs> we all know what K-pop is, but uh, <laughs> and then we just suggest the different ones you buy. We don't actually include it in the kit, so you can choose which puree you want to try in that beer. Interesting. Todd Todd was shaking his head like he knew K-pop. He's not up with it. He's he's a little. I was going to say I, I would be surprised if Chris knew K-pop before the kit came out. Like like we all know about. <laughs> that. I, I have eight year old twins who watch YouTube. You a lot. probably do know that. Yes, I do. Yeah, I've got three daughters who are uh, eleven, nine, and four. I know K-pop. <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know k-pop <laughs> i know k-pop my it's either disney radio or some k-pop and i'm like uh oh, let's go back to disney radio uh, Gosh, just put that as the title of this podcast just uh, k-pop. Yeah, k-pop, k-pop discussed yeah k-pop do you know k-pop disney? yeah do you know k-pop <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, to the, gilbert thank you so much for submitting the question this is a great time to remind y'all if and when we do take your question on a future episode we give you a 25 dollar gift card to ketconnection.com moving on to question number two came from our buddy adam e who also used the submission form at homebrewhappyhour.com adam wrote how long is too long when it comes to cooling the wort we brewed a pail last saturday outside during an unexpected heat wave because of the unexpected temperature we didn't prepare great for ice and it took over two hours for the yeast to get to eight or for the he put yeast i think he meant wort for the wort to get to 80 but once it did we pitched our yeast and said our prayers do you think it's likely we'll have problems with this batch? It's a pale ale. Cheers. Um, I've heard, especially down under, we have a big audience growing in Australia, that it's very common to use those cube things and do natural cooling. I, I don't know the actual phrase Hot for it. Hot packing. Hot packing. Thank you. And I, Todd, I don't think you remember, we made a bet almost two years ago that you haven't fulfilled where he said he would do all of the up to boil on one Saturday and then just leave it sitting and come and finish off the next weekend and not have any issues. And I bet him no. Well, in a in a in a in a cooler. I mean, yeah, yeah. At a at a, at a stable temperature. No, no, he keeps adding caveats. His claim <laughs> was, I could brew on this Saturday to boil and then come back next week. That's, that was almost verbatim what he said. But this might be one of those edible moments, Todd. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it may be. But with, with y'all with cooling, like obviously. For for me, for my stress on a brew day, I like getting it down quick. You know, we actually use immersion chillers. And we in Texas, if I'm brewing outside, we usually do a dual immersion setup where one's in the wort and one's in an ice bath. And that helps us get it down, you know, 30 minutes or less and we're pitching. And that's how I like it. Do you guys stress at all when you're brewing for, for that boil down to pitchable temps? Or are you kind of a relaxed, don't worry, have a homebrew? Absolutely stress the hell out <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Uh, you don't want to see. I've got isopropyl, tin foil, um, all kinds of stuff. Uh, and, and I recently discovered the joys of hot packing and using my refrigerator to get my temp down rather than the wort chiller because our groundwater here is 75 uh, oh, degrees in the summer, if not warmer. Um, so it's, you know, doing whether you're trying to cool in line before you cool the wort or I do a recirculation of my wort while doing the immersion chiller to help cool it down faster. But I'd say um, to Adam, the biggest thing he's got to make sure he's doing in these timeframes is the amount of photos I see on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, where people just have the wort chiller in there and the lid open and and just nothing on top. It's like, you got to be kidding me. Um, You know, anything under 180, you know, you're you're a spawning ground probably of bacteria and whatnot. So just simple precautions such as covering it um, the best you can. Immersion makes it a little harder. So, you know, that's why I love tinfoil too, to just, you know, bacteria doesn't typically fly or anything like that. So it's just stopping it from falling down. 
Interesting. You're stressing on their behalf. I like this. You're going- yeah, yeah, always. I, the, the more they make bad beer and, and give their friends their homebrew, that's bad. That's bad for business. I like your. I, I don't stress, Josh. <laughs> that's all. What is your? I do all the stressing. I, I like Chris stress, but we I, one of our last beers we actually brewed together. Chris, we we hot packed in the stainless steel conical, which is one of the advantages of the conical yeah. is going in hot. Everything is at that point you know, close to sterile, but definitely sanitized. And then just turning the cooling on, on the conical and pitching the next morning, uh, you're, you're reducing some of that exposure that Chris talked to. I think if you can cool fast and, and keep sanitary conditions, you're always best to, to cool it uh, fast. But I, I think the differences between the benefits of cooling and the, the additional hot break you're getting versus the uh, reduction in possible contamination and the ease on the brewing process of hot packing is just something to consider for, for some brewers who can do it. Yeah. And when you're going to hot pack that the key is, you know, just getting, going into something that you feel comfortable that you're going to seal up um, and, and not have it be open. The worst and, and be able to uh, deal with the contraction as it cools in some way. Right. So you're not sucking the suck, suck or, oxygen back in. Yeah. Yeah, the worst thing is having a smooth brew day and then infection happening post boil. Like that'll ruin your day. That'll ruin. Well, that's why. I mean, personally, you know, as I matured, um, I I stopped drinking much on my brew day in the beginning, <laughs> and and saved like my first sip of beer for after I pitched the yeast um, as, as the uh, ideal <laughs> situation. As Olin makes fun of me already, but yeah, uh, he's giving you a suspicious look. Like, do you really? Yeah. Know? yeah. Do you I, I said when I matured, and that was years ago. I've I've since not matured. Um, it must be his other brewing partner, Josh. Uh, <laughs> how much beer did I have on top of Mount Whitney? I, I'm the same way. I I don't like to. Uh, I, I usually start brewing pretty early in the morning. A lot of times too, so uh, I don't really have a beer until I'm done usually. But it, it it varies. I mean, sometimes when we brew on the podcast and it's a big group of us, we. We may change that a little bit. Yeah, I changed the yeah. view to just being your camera so I didn't look like I was laughing as you were saying that. Like, are you, come on. No, he's right. When he brews on his own, he does. He starts at like 630 in the morning. And oh, geez. Yeah, he starts because he preheats in the in the three vessel system. He'll preheat. That's awesome. and yeah, yeah I get it real. I'll get it almost up to boiling the night before. So when I walk in to brew, it's almost it's almost ready. That's so perfect. that. Just turn it on and it's pouring your grains. Probably yeah. twenty or thirty. Minutes. Again, reiterating the convenience of being a home brewer in twenty twenty one with yeah. with technology. Because like I, we we talked about this with uh, I think it was Horst Dornbush on many episodes ago. Because I always theorized like I think ancient beer was probably awful. Like we some people romanticize like oh I want to brew like they used to and I'm gonna just have a fire going to. It's like mm, I don't think they're. I mean it was potable and it was probably safer than their water supply. I don't think we'd call it good beer by today's standards. I'm willing to be wrong, but it just didn't have the means that we have. And even with the means we have, sometimes we make bad beer, <laughs> like even with the means of, of technology. So I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I read the other day that diacetyl was considered to be an important flavor in, in a lot of styles, you know, a couple hundred years ago. Well, I'm about to go pro then. Like yeah. this is a, <laughs> I've got that down. Just oh, Chris, now that now that I have your email and, and cell phone, I'm gonna I'm gonna stress you out when I brew. When you see how we chill, and then how me and my dad we do secondary a lot of beers, how we we open transfer. Oh, you're gonna have a heart attack. Hey, listen, you have to keep calling James. You now that you have a cell phone, you can't call Chris. <laughs> Every time you have a question while you're home, that's okay. I'll just text him back a link to an article called "Closed Brewing." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually saw that one on your site before because I was like uh, showing my dad because Todd, everyone's been telling us you need to do closed transferring too. And I'm like, okay, I do okay. closed transfer. You do, no, you, I mean, you do, even yeah. when I, I do use secondaries, glass secondaries, if I'm not using my nice fermenter, but I I purge the, I actually completely purge it with CO2 put a cap on it and then do the transfer closed so that it's uh, so I'm not really, and, and I push it with CO2 over. So it's not really getting any oxygen in there. Yeah. Which we, we think is great for you, the people who know what they're doing and can flush the the secondary fermenter. It's a completely different deal. But when Chris and I talk about secondaries for people up front, they don't have the ability to flush. So we definitely just try to, to stay away from, recommending new brewers to do secondaries because we right, see right. and have seen way more oxidation oh, issues yeah. 
than any benefits. You know, I was going to say that it's the benefit gain, you know, yeah. question that is there enough benefit from doing this secondary and on most beer right. styles? Absolutely not. Right. Oh, for sure. I totally oh, agree. When I started brewing, I used to tell people when they would try my beer. I mean, this was 30, 30 years ago. I'd say, they'd say, what is that flavor? And I go, oh, that's, that's okay. All home brews have that flavor <laughs> and that flavor. I can, that, I can promise you now yeah. that I know more that cardboard was oxidation. Good. Yeah. So, a little cardboard. Uh, cardboard. <laughs> Never heard that's, anybody. That's just a normal flavor. Yeah. Y'all are gonna, if, you have, uh, if you love cardboard, you're in luck. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. <laughs> yeah. My cardboard pail. Y'all, y'all have heard of it. That's good. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stress you both that when y'all get the pictures of the open transfer, I've got a beer. We're outside in the cigar in my mouth. Like, Oh, look guys, we're, we're brewing. <laughs> like, you know what? The, the best part of all this, as long as you're happy, everybody's That's happy. Right. It, it's when they're not happy Absolutely, and, yeah. you know, with their beer, then we talk about the next level. You're correct. I'm yeah. only going to be shocked, Josh, if you have cardboard uh, staves that you've uh, inserted into your, into your beer. <laughs> that would, okay. Don't give me ideas, man, because that's fantastic. <laughs> I like that, actually. We, uh, all right, do y'all, uh, you, you said, you mentioned Reddit earlier, Chris. I don't know, because if I had mentioned already, but did you remember that post couple years ago of that microbrewery filtering their beer into the keg they had like a coffee filter and they were splashing it like and th- this was people i mean they sell beer for a living like i looked at that and i was like i could go not pro too. Long. oh yeah you're right yeah, you're- not for long yeah <laughs> i saw that Any, like- anyone who uses a funnel after it's cooled down scares the hell out of me <laughs> oh for sure i totally agree and i saw that and i did i, was, I think i texted it to james or somebody i was like i could go pro look i don't mess up like that <laughs> like like these guys I, but i don't have capital investment behind me maybe that's the problem but anyway wonder why yeah, yeah. I wonder why, when i present my banker with my ideas they kick me out it's funny yeah. uh thank you adam so much for submitting the question guys we got one final question for you all and it's a voicemail from our buddy nick down in san antonio hey guys this is nick down in san antonio and i had a question about uh barrel aged beer um it's something that's been on my bucket list for a while and i'm curious when i go since it's going to age for so long um i've had issues in the past with bottle bombs and trying to use priming sugar so i'm curious if i were to keg it instead so I could carb it to the right level and then use something like a beer gun to can it. Um, can that sit on a shelf or do I need to keep those uh, refrigerated some way um, compared to if I were to try and bottle condition with uh, priming sugar? Um, just curious what you guys' thoughts are there. Um, it'd be a lot easier to kind of dial in that carb level. Um, one last thing, and just a fun fact on your last episode, uh, 245 on transporting a fermenting batch. So when you're talking about some places that have, you know, bottles of liquor that move around in a boat, um, actually Jester King right by you guys makes a beer called the Cool Ship Road Trip. Um, they brew it at Jester King, then they load it onto a trailer and they bring it all the way up to Oklahoma to America Solera, which is, uh, I think run by a guy from, uh, Prairie to finish. So just a fun fact there, maybe give it a try. Um, also, Joshua, the listener feedback, just want to say it just has this odd resemblance to Crusty the Clown from The Simpsons. Anyways, hope you guys are doing great. Uh, keep up the good work. Thanks. I got, I got, I've meant to end it before that. Uh, <laughs> we, I, I didn't, we didn't have listener feedback this episode, so you didn't get to hear the nice bumper that I made for it. And Todd made the mistake of letting me know how much it bothers him, so that's why I kept the bumper. But uh, that, it's a good question. Thank you, Nick, for submitting that. I have never done any of the above barrel aging or or any of that. And you know, I'm I'm very familiar with the the beer gun, but I'm not familiar with the process of if he's going to be you know transferring with the beer gun from there, how he needs to treat it post, I guess that transfer. Do you guys have experience with that? Can y'all help Nick out? There's so much to unpack from that, oh, no, uh, that no, set of no, questions, no. those barrel aging and, and understanding how to do it and, and how much extra you have to have to keep the barrel topped up because you're, you're you know losing water all the time. So just take that into mind, Nick, as you're doing this, but in terms of carbonating and kegs, and then bottling it, that's been done for a long time yeah. and very predictable. Um, I would say, you know, the, the one thing to consider, uh, the beer gun's awesome, sell a ton of them, but I prefer it for short-term aging because yep. you're not truly, you know, um, counter-pressuring. So right. I would say look into counter-pressuring as opposed to just filling 
when it comes. And I, cans are a tough one because you talked about canning um, and, and terms of oxygen pickup and whatnot of whatever it is he's he's making of these big beers. I would say probably bottles would be better. But once you're carbonated at the right level, which will require cooling, as you guys know, but I don't know if he knows that. Um, but once you get it there and you bottle it, no, you don't have to store it in a refrigeration. You can store it um, warm again. Probably put a few caveats in there about bottle bombs and, and uh, <laughs> how filtration would help them with that. And maybe cold crashing since you're going to uh, force carb it anyway. But that's my 10 cents on that subject. Yeah, I, I agree with that too. I think, you know, that is, the beer gun is a great product. We, I use it quite a bit when I want to take beer over to a friend's house or my, my dad's house maybe. Uh, but uh, the old school counter, pro, counter pressure bottle filler where you would purge the bottle, bring them both up to the same pressure, I just don't – when you do it the proper way, I don't think you get any oxygen in there. Or I probably shouldn't say any, but – uh, you get very, very minimal oxygen, and I think it would store a lot better that way. I, I, I completely agree on that. What is so it? Going back to the oak, uh, the when so we recently had two beers that that we made, uh, Chris, together with Darren. Was one was a multi brown, and then we put oak cubes into the carboy instead of using a barrel, which is really the preferred method. I think that that I like for repeatable results just because you're getting the oak flavor. And when you age in oak, for a winery, you're aging in oak because you get the micro-oxygenation over the period of a year and a 60-gallon barrel is the right surface area for wine to be aged for that, that period of time. And anything smaller, it gets over-oaked in wine for that period of time. So when now we go down to five-gallon barrels, if you're using a whiskey or whatnot, you, you could be, if it's a new barrel, you could be in that barrel for a week before you, you, you think that it's over-oaked if it's like some of the new Hungarian oak barrels that we sell. If it's a used whiskey barrel, it might be longer. But what we do always recommend, Chris had a quick point there, is that have, have keg it first and then go into the barrel so that you retain a little bit to top the barrel up. If you're going to store it in your barrel for any length of time, it's a week, it's a no big deal. But if you're trying to go with an Imperial stout and, and store it there for six months or something like that, you will need some top up. Yeah. I'll say one more thing is, you know, we've seen a lot of people do barrels over the years and the most successful I've ever seen is typically groups, clubs, whatnot, where they can do the bigger size barrel, get that right, you know, volume to oak ratio, and then they can brew enough beer and have extra beer to top up later with, and then they'll pull partials out, you know, and, and bottle that up and then, you know, keep it going because really owning a barrel is a big investment. You don't put it away dry, put it and store it somewhere for a year or two, pull it out and use it again easily. You got to keep the wood swollen so that it stays sealed. It's, um, it's usually something where you're going to, plan to have the next barrel project and the next barrel project stacked up. To, to expand on the question just real quick before we wrap up the show, because I'm just interested, you know, we... You're going to expand on that question. I, a part of it, just a part of it, tiny part. Um, because what they're talking... So we, we obviously, we push everyone to kegging not just because of our personal bias of being keg connection but the convenience of it and, oh yeah it, but but if you had to pick between bottling or canning you know for this instance you were talking about ah the possible oxidation issues when you do the canning do you do you prefer bottles over cans in every instance or are you fans of canning as well at a homebrew canning. level canning good okay so yeah you prefer canning for homebrewers than like if you were if you had to pick one between bottling or canning you'd pick canning well, I mean, bottling so cheap. It can be so cheap. Canning gets a little bit more expensive. So it's hard to say like, oh, if we're going to make a starter kit around canning, it, you know, there's, there's sure. a bit of an investment to get going on there, especially from the seeming perspective. And you don't naturally carbonate in a can, I believe. I, maybe you can, uh, but that's not typical. Uh, but from a consumer, which is, you know, the important part of this hobby, I love cans. I have a pool, so cans are great by the pool. Cans are great to bring to friends. Cans are great to go hiking with. Cans are great to go fishing with. Um, Theoretically, if you can get the oxygen out of the can up front, which is a little bit harder part, the can has less oxidation over time because there is oxygen ingress in a bottle through the cap. Sure, sure. 
but it's such a small ingress that it's, I feel it's safer. I could be wrong though. We're going to have some engineer types, I promise you, and I'll forward you their emails when they're like, actually, right. when Chris said that, you know, Perfect. I don't know if that's three how they quarters of our listeners are engineers. So they uh, are. The, well, they're, all, they're often telling us what idiots we are, which we appreciate. Right, Josh? When when it's you. Yeah. Uh, it, y'all, y'all been in the industry so long. Three quarters of your customers are probably engineers. Engineers love to brew their own. Oh, beer. It's, it makes perfect sense, too, when you think about it, the hobby. Absolutely, it does. Yeah. Before I brewed beer, I mean, granted, I was un- I started around 18-ish. <laughs> I didn't know what a ball valve was or how it worked. Right. And, you know, I remember the first time I really wanted to put one on my boil kettle because it's convenient for me. I was like, oh, this thing's pretty cool <laughs> how this thing works. <laughs> and, you know, it's just kind of funny to think, like, uh, if I hadn't gotten into this, I may not know how a ball valve works to this day because you don't need to use them that often. Right. Absolutely. That's hilarious. Uh, gentlemen, I appreciate y'all's time, uh, especially on helping out with the questions. Like I said, there was some questions in there I, I brought because I was like, oh, they, they surely they have experience with it. And I didn't even ask y'all. I just threw curveballs at you and, and y'all nailed them. I appreciate that. And and obviously everything y'all are doing at More Beer, um, you know, we, we like what y'all are doing and the recipes. I didn't get to say it earlier when Todd was he was, you know, complimenting y'all on all the, the stuff about recipes. Y'all's recipe artwork. I judge people off their artwork. I love the artwork. That when when Todd told me about the whole thing going down, I was like, this is acceptable. I mean, I have no input at all. It, it, my opinion matters nothing, but because y'all's artwork and y'all always ship out uh, the recipe kit with the insert for the tap and everything. I don't know if y'all, y'all I'm assuming you do your artwork in house. That'll be the one thing I miss about getting out of recipes because one of my favorite things to do was to design recipe artwork. But I, I, y'all's recipe artwork. Oh, we'll send you some uh, artwork to work on periodically. There you Absolutely. go. Yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 very, we're really looking forward to working with more beer in the future and. And we, again, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast and we appreciate you taking care of some of the listeners as we move forward. Cool. Let's talk about that really quick. And I sure. think we, we could kind of cover this briefly, but yeah. you know, as, as you mentioned earlier, we bought the website. So we bought the URL. We didn't buy the, the database of past invoices and such. So we're going to have a way and, and, you know, if you're having a problem with something gone in the past, reach out to Keg Connection. They'll yes. be able to help you. We are working together. If you have a gift card, you can either use it at More Beer because uh, we're going to bring those in or use them at Keg Connection. Um, so, it, you know, and then if you're coming over to More Beer for the first time, you should be presented with 15% off your first order. Um, so love to have you as a customer and check out the product selection. Well, and you know the stats better than I do, but how many malts and hops and whatnot? I think we're over 180 malts, a couple hundred hops. I think we just we just had an ad BYO that came out with all the stats and it was like, okay, well, that's a lot. Yeah, yeah that's a, a lot. lot of so we got to cut back on some yeah. of these. Yeah. These are varieties. These aren't like sizes. These are varieties right. which have multiple sizes right. underneath them. Yeah, no, that's incredible. Yeah, I mean, I was in charge of our ads. I lied on our ads all the time. I don't know what your ad person did, but okay. I mean, you know, thousands of recipes. I mean, we had like 200. Uh, our, our big walk-in cooler here is bigger than my house, just to give you a perspective oh. Oh, wow. of, of uh, the size. That's just package tops. That's just package tops. Wow. That's wow. so cool. Guys, again, thank y'all so much for your time. I appreciate it. We'll ho- hopefully have y'all on in the future again. I'm sure this episode will be well received, specifically because we'll bring on topics that we wouldn't normally talk about, like puree and beer and stuff. But anyway, I appreciate y'all's time. Thank you so much. Yep, thank, thank you guys for having us. Absolutely. And that will do it for this episode of the Homebrew Happy Hour. If you have a question you would like us to discuss on a future episode, go to homebrewhappyhour.com and click on that submit a question link at the top of the page. Or now you can call or text them in by using 325-305-6107. Thank you to our show sponsor, Imperial Yeast. You'll get a free pack of Imperial Yeast with your monthly Trub Club recipe kit. Go to patreon.com forward slash homebrew happy hour to learn more. Thanks again to Olin and Chris for coming on the show this week. And on behalf of Todd Burns, James Carlson, and the Pearl Media Network, I'm Joshua Steubing. Thank you for listening. <laughs>